Hello, everyone. I'm Ed Lee, Director of Human Genomics Marketing here at PacBio, and I want to welcome everyone to our webinar, Revealing the Unseen in Human Genomic Research Sequencing. Today, we'll cover some exciting new applications and tools for Hi-Fi Reads that will help researchers like you overcome current technological limitations and will help to fuel your new discoveries. To provide you with some information that will help you better understand today's presentations, I'd like to present a slide to describe what PacBio Hi-Fi Reads are. PacBio Hi-Fi reads are both long and very accurate. On the left, you can see how Hi-Fi libraries are constructed and how Hi-Fi sequencing works. Kilobase long fragments of interest are ligated to circular adapters called smart bells to create a circular library prep. A polymerase performs a rolling circle amplification covered, covering the forward and reverse strands multiple times. In each raw read, the errors made by the polymerase are random and not systematic, which allows the software to easily correct them via consensus and to create the resultant Hi-Fi reads in green. Hi-Fi reads are long, single molecule reads that achieve 99.9% .9 accuracy. And when Hi-Fi reads are used to sequence to a certain depth, for example, a 30X genome, the consensus achieves an even higher accuracy of 99.95%. This is illustrated by the figure on the right, which comes from the findings of the Precision FDA Truth Challenge version 2. In their, accuracy, in their accuracy assessment of three platforms, you can see that PacBio had the highest accuracy, as well as a very narrow width and distribution, indicating that most reads achieve greater than Q30. Now that you know more about Hi-Fi being greater than 100 times longer than short reads and greater than 10 times higher accuracy than nanopore reads, let's move on to our presentations. Both presentations today have been pre-recorded. However, our speakers will be here live for a Q&A at the end of the presentations. We'll also be taking questions via chat during the presentation, so please feel free to send your questions in. I'm thrilled to be able to introduce our speakers today who will present in the following order. Igor Dolzenko, Principal Scientist at PacBio, will present an ex on, on an exciting new software tool that when used together with Hi-Fi Reads will enable researchers to comprehensively genotype and detect genome-wide tandem repeats and repeat expansions. And anchoring our presentation today, Tina Hahn, Senior NGS Business Solutions Manager at Twist Biosciences, will present on the exciting new combination of long and accurate Hi-Fi Reads with the exceptional enrichment performance of Twist Capture Probes. This combination will bring researchers an economical way to achieve high coverage depth of their targets of interest. The pairing of these two technologies should be useful in not only resolving, but phasing traditionally difficult but relevant areas of the genome to target, in particular areas of high homology and GC-rich and repetitive regions. Now I'll turn it over to Igor. Please enjoy the presentations. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for attending this webinar. My name is Igor, and I'm a bioinformatician at PacBio. Um, so today, I wanted to tell you about our new uh, tandem repeat genotyping tool, or TARGET. Let's uh, start this presentation with a quick overview of, of tandem repeats. Uh, so tandem repeats are regions of the genome that consists of tandem copies of some uh, DNA motif. This motif can be very short, even a single base pair in case of homopolymers, or could be very long and uh, potentially 100 base pairs or longer. We care about tandem repeats because there are very many of them in the, in the human genome, and also because they've been linked to everything from basic gene expression changes to genome instability in cancer, to diseases like ALS, fragile X, Huntington disease. And also, uh, th there was recently very exciting work linking uh, tandem repeats with autism spectrum disorders and schizophrenia. Um, another reason to care about tandem repeats is because they're responsible for a large uh, fraction of uh, human, uh, human genetic variation. So this slide is based on work uh, performed by Adam English at Baylor. So um, Adam is working with a, um, a uh, set of repeats that span just under 4% of the genome, and yet Adam found that uh, they contain around 75% of uh, structural variants that are at least uh, 50 base pairs or longer. So again, you know, relatively small uh, uh, fraction of the genome is responsible for uh, a huge fraction of, 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 the, of the variation. Um, and the kind of variation that we might see in repeat regions uh, ranges from um, things like large repeat expansions. So these are situations when um, the repeat is very uh, short in healthy people, but can expand. And in some cases, uh, these expansions are pathogenic. 
Um, there are also sequence composition changes, uh, and some of them are also known to be pathogenic, and also uh, epigenetic changes like hypermethylation. And if we look at the right side of this, um, at the right side of the slide, we uh, we see an an example uh, repeat. So this is an fmr one repeat in this well characterized sample NA07537. So this plot was made by taking um, pieces of high fi reads that overlap fmr one repeat and then stacking them together. So uh, the top half of this plot shows us reads that overlap a short 87 base pair repeat allele, while the bottom half of this plot um, uh, shows us a re reads that overlap and exp long expansion. Um, the expansion, this, the exact size of the expansion ranges from uh, one DNA molecule to another DNA molecule. And here we can see that it ranges from 840 to about 1200 base pairs. Um, also, uh, pink color corresponds to a CPG methylation, so we can also see that the expanded allele is heavily methylated, just like you would expect it to be. Um, and the good news is that high fi reads can span the vast majority of tandem repeats in the human genome, and of course the repeats that cannot be spanned can be assembled or pieced together through other means. Um, and, and the bad news is that, you know, we're still often using uh, generic indel colors to profile variation in tandem repeat regions. And oftentimes this, uh, these generic, uh, generic tools are not sufficient. So we really need to develop specialized ventromatic tools for tandem repeat analysis. And this is what we set out to do. So we implemented uh, the tools that are described in this slide. So the first one is called uh, tandem repeat genotyping tool or target. So target estimates uh, the kinds of things that we talked about on previous slide, including um, repeat allele sequences, including repeat lengths, and also CPG methylation. And then uh, tandem repeat visualizer, or TR, um, it, it is a simple visualization tool, so it displays reads that overlap, overlap repeats. And then finally, we're also working on uh, creating a genome-wide tandem repeat catalog together with the Genome in the Bottle Consortium and many collaborators. Um, and if you're interested in, in trying out a target, it's available um, through the link below on GitHub. All right, so here is the clo closer look of how uh, target works. So you, it needs two pieces of input. The first one is set of aligned hi-fi reads. So this will be just your normal uh, BAM file that will come out from the standard pipeline. And then also a list of repeat definitions. So here is one example of, of a repeat definition. So it just describes a repeat located on chromosome X. In fact, this is the definition of um, FMR1 repeat. And this repeat consists of a CGG motif as you can see from the definition. And so target takes the reads and then repeat definitions on input and then outputs for each repeat, um, the uh, allele, repeat allele sequences, repeat lengths, methylation levels, and more information. And then optionally, you can also use uh, tandem repeat visualizer or TRVs to generate pl plots like shown on the bottom right. So here's a closer look at the TRVs plot. So the top track, in the top track we can see uh, the actual repeat allele and the flank and the, and the flanking sequence around it, um, and and then below it you can see how reads uh, align to that repeat allele. So by um, looking at TRV's plots, you can do both. You you can inspect the structure of, of the repeat, and also you can use it as as a quality control to make sure that uh, the repeat was genotyped correctly. Um, here is another. Uh, plot. So in this case, we're looking at CNBP repeat region. What makes this region interesting is that it contains three adjacent repeats. The first repeat um, uh, is uh, is composed of CAGG motif. The second repeat is composed of CAGA motif, and the third repeat is composed of CA motif. Um, as far as I know, only uh, the first CAGG uh, repeat is pathogenic and its expansions cause disease, but still in order to analyze this region accurately, we have to account for, for all three repeats. Uh, here is yet another example. This is RFC1 repeat. Um, so expansions of this repeat with certain um, motifs, uh, they cause a disease called canvas. Um, so in, in this particular repeat, you know, of course it has two alleles. The first allele is very short. It, um, it consists of a 4A and a G motif, while the second longer allele is, uh, consists of a mixture of 4A and a G motif and the motif uh, with uh, and motif AAG, AG. Uh, and um, once we developed a target in TRVs, of course we wanted to um, um, 
to test out the tools as much as possible. And I uh, here I'll present a few examples of these analyses that we've done. Uh, the first one is um, Mendelian consistency analysis. So here, what we did is we analyzed a draft repeat catalog from the genome in a bottle consortium. This catalog contains around uh, 1 million tandem repeats, right? And we looked at um, the, uh, the Mendelian consistency, which I am about to describe. We also looked at the alignment, quality, coverage, depth, and, and concordance with existing genome assemblies. Uh, in order to write as, as measures of accuracy. Again, we're doing it because we don't have a, uh, a true set for this catalog yet. And on these slides, I'll just highlight the Mendelian consistency analysis. So um, to do the Mendelian consistency analysis, we genotyped all, all the repeats in, in the catalog in a family trio consisting of mother, father, and the child. And then we um, we uh, we looked at we looked for concordance of repeat sizes. So an example of consistent call is shown on the left panel of this plot. So here the child has repeats of size five and seven, um, and evidently the repeat of size seven must come from the mother, while the repeat of size five, five must come from, must come from the father. Uh, in the middle, it's an example of off by one call. Here, uh, the ch child has a repeat of size eight, which is not present in either mother or father. But if we reduce the size of um, this repeat from eight to seven, then the call becomes Mendelian consistent. And finally, it is, it's an example of, uh, on the right is an example of a larger error here. Um, you know, neither one of the parents has um, a repeat of size eight, uh, at 10, I'm sorry, or anything close to it. So that's the idea. And so this slide actually shows the Mendelian consistency results. So um, we, and we stratified them by the lengths of the repeat motifs. So we see um, the largest amount of errors on, on the left, uh, which correspond to motifs of length one. So these are homopolymers, perhaps not, you know, perhaps this, this is expected that the homopolymers will be a little bit noisier than other repeats. But even for homopolymers, we see that the vast majority of errors are off by one, um, off by one calls. And you see that also that the, the error quickly shrinks as, the, uh, as, the, as we increase the, the length of the, of the repeating motif. And in general, if we accept off by one errors, the Mendelian consistency uh, becomes uh, around 99%. Right, and, um, and so after we did um, this and other um, uh, analyses that uh, confirmed to us that uh, target produces uh, genotypes with, with reasonable accuracy, we, um, we, we started doing analyses like the one shown on this slide. So here we're looking at um, 200,000 polymorphic tandem repeats, and we genotype them in 100 samples from Human Pet Genome Reference Consortium. And um, as expected, this analysis revealed that many of these repeats are indeed polymorphic in our uh, set of samples. So if we look at the, um, the bar on the left labeled with two, what this bar tells us is that um, around 30 repeats in our, um, in, you know, among the, uh, in, in among the set that we've analyzed, um, have only two alleles of distinct sizes. While on the right side of this histograms, we see, histogram, we see that there were a few percent of repeats that had 15 or more uh, distinct repeat alleles in 100 samples. So these repeats are very polymorphic. And in general, non-pathogenic repeats tend to be very polymorphic, so they would correspond to the right, right side of this histogram. And then finally, the two inset histograms show um, examples of, um, of uh, repeats. Well, on the left is with uh, a repeat with three, with, with, um, with three distinct repeat alleles and on the right with nine distinct repeat alleles. And for these examples, and in general, we observe that um, usually there are a few um, dominant high, fre high frequency sizes while the other sizes appear a lot less frequently. We have also analyzed methylation uh, in, in across uh, the tandem repeat regions. And the way that we did it is for we used target to um, to estimate the mean methylation level uh, for each repeat allele, and then we stratified the results by the CPG density of the repeat alleles. So um, what this plot shows us is that CPG dense regions are, uh, they correspond to lower CPG methylation, while uh, regions that are more CPG sparse on the left, they have higher CPG methylation. Uh, this is not unexpected because this is how human genomes are. Uh, you know, human genomes have very high background methylation and also um, 
in, you know, in most of the human genome is very CPG sparse. And then there are also CPG dense regions that are called CPG islands that usually have low methylation, especially intramotors. So again, what we see here is consistent with what we know about methylation in the human genomes. At the same time, you, um, you can also really tell that there is a lot of variability in, in methylation levels. And sure enough, we found many repeats that had um, you know, very interesting methylation levels. So here's one of them. Um, this repeat, um, uh, this is a repeat on chromosome X. And if we look at the methylation uh, of reads, uh, overlapping this repeat, we see that they, um, they have this bimodal um, distribution where half of the reads support low methylation while the other half support high methylation. Right, um, and I, I believe that this repeat is also annotated as a, um, a putative enhancer by, by GenCode. Uh, and in the final portion of my talk, I wanted to present uh, the work that we're uh, the work that we're doing now on more complex repeat regions. So this is uh, an, an example um, of this of a repeat located in KC and MB2 gene. So this is what this repeat looks like in, in, in the reference genome. So if we start looking at this plot from top to bottom, you'll see that this, this region is about 3.5 uh, kilobases in length. It is located in an intron of this gene, right? And then in the middle, um, we see the alignments of high fi reads. The alignments are very noisy. We see many insertions, deletions, mismatches um, that make it very hard to understand what's going on here. And if we look at the bottom of the black bars, they um, they correspond to to um, um, repeat annotations in the reference genome, and you 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 can see they're not very helpful either, right? Because what we can tell is that it looks like this region has low complexity, it has a lot of um, it corresponds to many uh, AT rich repeats, but it's very hard to take this information together and make you know any any kind of sense with it. Uh, however, if we actually start looking at, at the actual sequence of this um, re of this region, uh, the pattern a pattern starts to emerge. So what we can see is that the um, we can separate this um, this repeat region into pieces, motifs that look like this, where every single motif starts with um, a CT repeat in green, followed by this uh, conserved AAG AGG core sequence in purple followed by AT repeat. And it turns out that you can uh, separate the entire repeat region into motifs like this, uh, not just in the reference, but also in, in all the samples that we have analyzed. And here is the, here is the results of the analysis of this, of this repeat region uh, using, uh, using target. So this is exactly the same region that, you know, that we looked at uh, a few slides ago. Uh, and so here we can see that everything is very clean, right? We clearly see two distinct repeat alleles. Uh, the first uh, repeat allele con consists of about 100 and um, over just over 120 copies of the motif, while the second allele contains just over 105 copies of, of the of the motif. All right. And if you squint and look very closely at the tick marks which delineate motif boundaries, you will see that they are not evenly spaced. And this makes sense because um, because as we saw in the previous slide, the exact uh, sequence of, of the motif change from one motif copy into the other, uh, but the, all the motif copies do have the same structure. So this is again an example of, of analysis of complex region and how we can um, kind of take a very messy region uh, and then use target to, to analyze it in, in a very kind of consistent and, uh, and clear way. And here is, and we, we did this analysis, in fact, for 100 uh, HPRC samples. And this plot gives us the histogram of repeat lengths, of repeat allele lengths um, in all these 100 samples. Um, and the length is given by the motif count. And so you can see that the repeats are generally a very polymorphic. The um, repeat alleles range in size from about 100 motif copies, which is about 3 kb to close to 150 copies, which is, uh, which is close to uh, 4.5 KB. Right, anyway, and so that's, um, and that's, the, that's the end of my talk. I, just in conclusion, I wanted just to summarize that we have developed tools for genotyping and visualization of tandem repeats in HiFi data. This is the, you know, the very beginning of this project, so we're still uh, we're planning to make uh, you know, many improvements to the tool, implement very uh, you know, many new features, 
and we hope that we'll get to collaborate with, with our customers on all of this work. It, specifically, in particular, if you're interested in analyzing tandem repeats in the human genome or other diploid or haploid genomes, please reach out to us. It would be very, you know, very, uh, it would be great to collaborate. Also, um, we're interested in um, analy analyzing repeats and RNA transcripts as given by um, by bioisoseq data. So, if this is something that you're interested in as well, please please reach out to us. Um, and you know, thank you very much. And I just wanted to thank all the incredible collaborators that have contributed to this project. And I wanted to thank all of you for um, uh, for listening to this webinar. We'd we'll be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you for PacBio for inviting Twist Bioscience to present today. Um, I'm Tina Hunt. I'm the Senior NGS Business Solution Manager. I will uh, present sequence with confidence, how long recapture with Twist target enrichment system can uh, empower your research. So Twist have a special way of making um, oligos. So we don't um, synthesize in a 96 well plate. We are using a silicon wafer to make uh, 9,600 genes in one go. So this really scale up the synthesis process. And when we synthesize the oligo, we have very nice uh, GC profile from the synthesis. And then we will use a proprietary way to amplify it up. So we have enough to do the capture. And because we have this special way to amplify, then we can maintain this GC profile in the, uh, your capture performance. So then you will always get the very nice uniform capture in your data. Um, in contrast, our competitors tend to have a bias in during their amplification methods. So they will have a lot of valley and, uh, you know, and peaks that are either under sequence or over sequence. So our way of amplification really makes sure that you have a uniform data at the end. The other advantage of this twist is that we have a double-stranded DNA to capture your uh, region of interest. So our double-stranded DNA can catch sense and anti-sense of, um, of your region of interest. Uh, so you can think of it as like a two shots on goal instead uh, our competitor only are having single stranded DNA that can only capture uh, your DNA of interest once. The other unique way of uh, twist target enrichment is that we have all the um, blockers and probes and beads are in our um, solution. So we have, once you prepare a library, we are using blocker to block the adapter sequence and also the um, repetitive regions. And we, our probes are biotinylated, so you can use strapping beads to capture it uh, using a magnetic bead system. And then we, during some washes, then this um, library fragment are ready for sequence. Normally we look at the target enrichment performance metrics by three uh, items. So uniformity, specificity, and library complexity. So again, uniformity is something that if we amplify the oligos uh, during synthesis is already uh, uniform, then it will also translate into data. So you don't have a lot of over sequence or under sequence region that translate into sequencing economy. So the more uniform your data is, then the less sequencing you have to do. Specificity wise is that how much probe we have in your capture can target your region specifically. And library complexity is something that you want to maintain the highest uh, as possible, just because normally the bioinformatics pipeline, the first thing they kick out of your data is the duplicate. So you want to make sure that you can maintain the highest library complexity as possible. So, so this slide kind of summarizes that we, in order to present or to preserve the useful data, in the green, you want to minimize the over sequencing area, also want to minimize the under sequencing area and, um, and also the off target region. So you can get the most information with the least amount of sequencing. In summary, uh, twist target enrichment can bring you exceptional performance 
uh, because we NGSQC all the probes. So you will have no uh, probe dropout when you get the probe uh, in the shipment. And we have very flexible modules, so you can order different kits, reagents separately. And last but not least, uh, the whole workflow enables you uh, maximize sequencing efficiency. So you will use uh, least amount of sequencing to get the data you need to do variant calling. So just quickly go over two fixed panels. So uh, we first have the SARS-CoV-2 research panel that uh, at the start of the pandemic in March, 2020, we have launched this panel. We don't have to ever change the content just because our probe are so special designed that they can capture even with mismatches. So this means uh, we can still capture the new variants. So for example, the Delta variant, Omicron variant, you name it, we can still use the same panel to capture the, lead, uh, the latest variants. And the same with our comprehensive viral research panel that is a, is a larger one. So you can capture all the variants you want to see. So we have shown that you can capture Zika, you can capture monkeypox. So again, um, our way of probe synthesis and plus our design algorithm really maximize how much you can see in your data. To summarize the key benefits of target enrichment is that in Instead of using whole genome sequencing, that you will uh, use 90 gig of data to, to see um, you know, just a few reads on your visual interest. But now, for example, in this case, uh, exon capture, you capture all the exons in your data, but you only need 7.5 gigabases. And then you can see uh, the regions very well. So you will normally get more than 20 reads in the locus in contrast to nine reads in a whole genome sequencing um, example. So next I'm going to uh, go into detail for the long recapture application, just because with PepBio we have collaborated on several projects and I'm going to go into um, deeper um, details. So here is a um, application now showing how twist target enrichment coupled with high by sequencing can bring best out of the data. Um, for example, here are just three panels. Example, um, you can have a large panel on a very large scale, 20 megabases, about 400 genes, and you can use, uh, put four sample in one smart cell. The medium panel, about 2 MB, then you can put around you know, 50 genes in one panel, and then in this case, you can have 24 sample in one smart cell. And for the small panel size, 100 KB, um, for example, BRCA1 or 2, you have only two genes because they are very long genes. And then this example, you can have about 96 sample per smart cell. So to get there with the twist and high fi sequencing is that you can put more sample in one smart cell. That's mean, uh, you know, you that lowers the cost of sequencing dramatically. And we have shown that you know, with target twist target enrichment, you can get a very good resolution of your target interest. This example is showing the NCF gene that's associated with uh, chronic granulomatous disease that in the HiFi WGS, you have uh, quite shallow coverage. However, with HiFi target enrichment, you can easily see the high enrichment uh, with a different haplotype, and you can fully phase them. Uh, in contrast with the short read, then you will tend to have gaps, right? Uh, just to, because of due to mapping issues with the uh, short read technology. And we have another example showing, for, in this case, it's a DPYD haplotype that if you capture the regions, this is a very long genes as well, and with a lot of exons, um, that you can, again, fully face the different haplotypes, and we can even do star allele calling um, in concordance with the G-term consensus call. And over 50 variant position will face nicely in this 50 kb region of uh, DPYD. 
And we do have a loan recapture protocol that's available online on our website. It is compatible with PyPal SQL 2 and SQL 2E. And this slide just showing you what our re region and the panel are uh, compatible with this Twist PyPal workflow. So all the boxes highlight yellow are recommended for this workflow. And just to start from uh, the beginning that the panel design, when you come to us, if you submit uh, lots of coordinates or G names, we will turn around the design within one to two days. And it will take a twist to um, synthesize uh, the panel within three weeks. And then you can carry out the genomic DNA extraction fragmentation that takes about one day. And you do the library prep for one day and target arrangement, you will normally start uh, doing overnight. And next day will be just only four hours to finish up. And then you can actually have the afternoon to do the pipe file library prep and then start the sequencing on the same date. And then within 24 hours movie time, the next day you have the data uh, for analysis. And the third party region we recommend are the KOD polymerase and DNA strengthening leads that are with larger diameter. And here's just a case, um, case study with our customer from Leiden that they have used our um, twist hybrid capture panel that they have about 23 genes in this two MB panel. They have a lot of SIP genes, HLA genes, class one, class two, and also other pharmacogenomics uh, uh, pharmacogenes also in this panel. And again, this is the whole workflow showing you how the, the, the wet lab from the shear DNA to library prep to enrichment and then to smart bell library prep and also the pipeline uh, via the smart link. And then for variant calling that uh, pipe already set up in their pipeline as well. And here is a nice result showing that when you have 24 sample in one smart cells, you can get very high coverage and about 94 of target region are at least cover um, 30 times. So that means you can do a very calling very confidently. And the loan recapture application, so far we have been working with various customers. We have working with pharmacogenomics panel, HL panel, we also have done a lot of inherited disease panel that focus on neurodevelopment disorder, for example, MF1, um, or whatever genes is difficult to capture with Shorey, we all demonstrate that it can be easily done with Lonely. And last but not least, we also have done some uh, proof of principle uh, analysis on repeat expansion and also methylation, just because sometimes the customer may not want to sequence the whole uh, genome uh, because that could be very cost, costly. Uh, in, if they only have a certain promoter they want to enrich, they can easily couple with our target enrichment system that uh, they can sequence those uh, region very deep, like to above 200X. So then they can make sure what they are, um, want to see is there. We also see a lot of customers trying to consolidate a lot of Amplicon assay. For example, they have done with single gene, and now they can merge all the Amplicon into one assay. So using a capture approach, then they can do more than 50 genes in one go. So that have been also very uh, efficiently uh, try to scale up, try to you know make their lab more efficiently. So this is uh, something that you know you can also think about. And last but not least, um, either you could want to look at viral genome or viral integration. For example, you want to see where integration site is. Maybe you need to have a long piece of DNA in order to, um, to find it. Then you can also use the long recapture. And we see a lot of iBio are also using the long re um, to try to capture the genes that were previous not, the genome wasn't unknown. So they would need a novel assembly, but then they could actually try to start with CDA capture. So they know all the exonic regions and then use that to 
try to capture the, the region of interest in, on the GDN level. And we see the we have seen a lot of customers doing isophone detection and fusion detection because they can also try to capture the known or novel fusions. And also the real transcript detection, uh, just because now you may, if you want to do the whole transcriptal scale, you may lose the resolution on the lowly expressed genes. So you have want to see those lowly transcripts, um, you can also do it in Richmond, and then you can fish them out and then try to interrogate deeply. And since our algorithm and probe design and our capture technology, we are hypothesis neutral. So this way can allow you to see a lot of um, regions that you previously are not able to see or not probably the fusion were unknown in the in literature. Uh, we welcome you to talk to us. So you can either send an email to our customer support at twistbioscience.com or you can catch us at the ASHG. It's coming out at the end of October in Los Angeles or the lonely sequencing in Uppsala uh, just right after ASHG. So now I'm welcome to any question you have. Thank you for your attention. Hey everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, now we'll move on to a Q&A. I wanna thank our speakers, Tina and Igor. Um, Tina, we have, uh, Tina and Igor, we have some questions coming in through the chat that I uh, would love to ask you. So um, maybe the first one for Tina, since, um, since you were the last to speak and, and it's fresh on everyone's mind. Um, maybe the first one is, does, does the twist pack bio workflow reduce the required amount of input gDNA compared to standard HiFi sequencing? Yes, we have done a lot of um, experiments using only 200 nanograms of fragment gDNA to start with. And we, uh, since our workflow involves PCR, so I'm so afraid uh, you definitely have enough uh, material for capture. And for that, we only need less than 200 nanograms again. So uh, don't worry, if you have low input, I, I think we can even push the limit, but so far we only uh, robustly test uh, 200 nanograms. Terrific, thank you. So that's that's quite a quite a reduction. That's that's fantastic. Um, okay, so Igor, I have a question for you from Susan Hyatt. Hi, Susan. Um, it says, Igor, uh, do you have an annotation in target TRBZ to identify predicted pathogenic ranges of expansion? How do you imagine annotating or flagging this? Yeah, excellent question. So we actually have uh, one of my colleagues is actually working on a tool for target that would do exactly this. So what this tool will do is it will take uh, target outputs and then check whether um, you know whether uh, there are any known pathogenic expansion and, and expansions. And the tool will look at both lengths of the repeats and also at the sequence composition of repeats. You know, as we know, sequence composition is important for repeats like RFC1. Um, right. And so we um, we will hopefully release this tool before ACG, but if you'd like to try a better version, please reach out to us. Um, you know, we can, we can, we can, of course, just, just share it with you privately. Terrific, thank you. Um, let's uh, move on to another question for Tina. This is from Sakina Saif. Uh, the question for Tina is, how do you process the long read sequencing data uh, can this also be applied to single cell? Um, so actually, PEPA has uh, built out a very nice pipeline, bioinformatics pipeline, so you can um, use that to map the reads and then also to um, get the line band file and also call the haplotype. So that one, um, I think, is available, so please probably contact your bio bioinformatics team. And then uh, the other thing is about apply to single cell. Um, so actually that's something we actively are working on. So uh, so for single cell, normally you do have to amplify up. So for DNA, 
so there's a WGM method I personally prefer. So if you want to start this collaboration, we can also uh, kick this off. And the other thing I'm also actually working on the single cell cDNA capture. So if you also have material from me and uh, I'm more than happy to take that over. Great, thank you, Tina. Um, yes, absolutely. For um, the person who asked that, if you are interested in, in more analysis options or support for long read um, sequencing from enrichment, please contact PacBio. Um, okay, so here's another question for Igor. Uh, this is from Simon Barnett. And um, the question, is it reasonable to think that off by one and larger errors would be reduced for repeats of length one, AKA homopolymers, if deep consensus were used for hi-fi generation instead of PBCCS, um, which is our, our uh, standard algorithm for hi-fi reads. I know the Google team was working on reducing homopolymer systematic error. Thanks. Excellent question. Um, so yes, absolutely. I'm not, in, unfortunately, I'm not involved in the deep, deep consensus work, so I don't know what kind of changes they are planning to, um, you know, to release specifically for homopolymers. But but yes, you know, uh, any amount of reduction in homopolymer errors will translate into markedly better um, genotypes of homopolymers by target. Terrific, Igor. Thank you. Yeah. So in general. Um, Deep consensus improves accuracy, which also applies to homopolymers. Um, we'll, we're certainly looking forward to kind of quantitating that more as we um, integrate more with deep consensus. All right, so um, let's see. Here is another question for Igor. Um, how do you do motif matching first followed by alignment for KCN M, B2, accurate alignment slash consensus sequence? Mm -hmm. Great question. So the way that the algorithm works, and of course I haven't talked about, uh, there was no time to talk about this uh, during the main presentation, but I'll just sketch it out at the very high level. So um, uh, the program uh, has a, um, uh, a model of the repeat, which is represented by a hidden profile Markov model, um, that that basically models the structure of the repeat and um, um, and that's what it uses to segment the read. So basically when uh, first a target detects reads that overlap this region, right, and then it runs that um, a hidden Markov model in order to um, resolve the structure of, of the of the reads. Uh, and, and basically what this model does, it just um, it finds the repeat boundaries. So it then outputs where each motif uh, repeat motif starts and ends, and that's basically what the uh, what the TRVs uses to visualize uh, to make the visualizations that you've uh, that I've showed uh, during during the presentation. And if you have any more questions about this, um, you know, please reach out. I'll be very happy to elaborate more because there's a lot more to say about the algorithm itself. Okay, thank you, Igor. I have another question for Tina. It says, uh, Tina, regarding fusion detection, the fusion detection application presented, how would this work for novel, i.e. unknown fusion events? Um, our probes does, so our probes are 120 base parallel, but we don't need to have the 120 base pair perfect match with your, your known uh, like, uh, region that you want to capture. So basically you can just use 60 base pair out of this 120 base pair, so half of it, to use as a hook to capture the thing you want to know and then use the other pieces to capture whatever is novel. So we have done proof of concept study. So um, yeah, contact us and we can elaborate more in the chat. So Tina, it sounds like you can create a probe to the known part. And since the, uh, the yes. reads are, are longer than the probes, they actually then can read into the unknown parts that, that aren't hybridized to your yeah. probes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, okay. And then um, a question for me, will this recording be available to us? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. The recording will be uh, sent to you via an email link to all registered uh, registrants of, of the webinar. Um, and then uh, how about, here's a question for Igor. Um, 
It says, Igor, how does PacBio make a difference in methylated versus unmethylated CPG sequences? I'm going to assume that means how do we denote that? Or maybe it's a question about how HiFi detects 5MC. Mm -hmm. Maybe how it detects so, and how it, how it shows it. Sure, sure. Um, so one, uh, so one um, sentence answer is that uh, the uh, uh, base incorporation kinetics is used to uh, distinguish between methylated C's and non-methylated C's. And let me post a link to uh, the chat um, to this incredible webinar uh, that um, that actually explains, um, you know, how the entire process works. Let's see. So you should get you should get the link now. Terrific. The it's come through, Igor. Thank you. Yeah. So um, maybe uh, maybe to elaborate on that. So so PacBio library, uh, PacBio HiFi sequencing um, detects not only the four bases, but it also detects five MC as well, with no um, no bisulfide treatment or additional treatment to the uh, to the DNA. Uh, it it does it by measuring the kinetic differences of base incorporation of the of the five MC. So um, it's a very unique. Uh, Thing for 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 PacBio. Um, okay, so uh, another question for Igor. Uh, Igor, have you tried target software on expanded repeats, e.g., 100 to 500 CAG repeats in Huntington's disease uh, beyond the 10 to 20 repeats shown in the presentation? Another great question. So we, um, I don't think I've come across any um, Huntington expansions yet that were that long. But we did um, detect pretty long expansions of other repeats. And would it be OK for me to share a slide? Um, or maybe not. Um, OK, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to share uh, slides um, with have the right permission, but I can just summarize. Uh, so we, um, I guess one of the collaborations that we participated in is the collaboration with Genomics England with 100,000 Genomes Project. And there we. Um, Identify use use target to identify uh, a a one um, uh, ex, fmr one expansion that's between uh, well around like three hundred um, to five hundred um, uh, motif, motifs I guess that spans around three hundred to five hundred motifs so that's considerably longer than um, than the, uh, the the Huntington expansion that you mentioned and then also we found um, an ataxinate expansion that consisted of um, about six hundred CTGs. And then also we found seven bilulic expansions of RFC1 repeat that were also pretty long. So so yeah, so it looks like it shouldn't be a problem to detect um, expan very long expansions in Huntington um, um, of the Huntington repeat or, or anything else based on the results that we have um, we found so far. That said, if you have uh, data, uh, if you have high fire samples with suspected expansions um, of this repeat or any other repeats, we'll be very happy to help analyze the data and interpret it. Great, Igor. So, if it were a 500 um, a, a repeat, a 500 repeats of CAG, that would be about 1,500 base pairs long, right? Right, Igor. That's right. So, That's right. High phi read length is is uh, is almost 10 times, well, sometimes 10 times longer than that. So, it should they should all span those repeats. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay, so um, here's a question for both Tina and Igor. Uh, Tina, Igor, my name is Paul Peter from Lab Scroll Medicals, Botswana. I am currently generating a population genome database of the Botswana population. How can your system assist me with my work? That sounds like an interesting uh, application for target for genotyping a, uh, a population in Botswana. Well, That's right, let's yeah. talk. <laughs> I think uh, shoot me an email and then we will get you in touch with our designer or um, project scientist, right, to, to start off your projects. Right. And on the target end, I think, um, you know, the goal of the target project is to, you know, not just to profile known um, kind of pathogenic and functional repeats, but also start to analyze these more complex regions like the KCNP2 uh, repeat region that I presented at the end of the presentation. So I think it would be super cool to start looking at, um, to do like population analysis of, of, of regions like this. Um, and I think there's a lot that we can learn from, from this because these regions are very uh, variable and I suspect we will be able to see very many uh, kind of population specific differences in regions like that. 
Uh, so Paul, please reach out. Uh, Igor and, and, and Tina, uh, you, you can reach out via via um, post webinar or post webinar, and, and we can get you in contact with both Tina and Igor. Um, all right, here's a question for Tina. Tina, will will customers be able to subset the different hard to sequence genes in the dark regions panel? Maybe only take 50 or 100 genes to make a smaller panel. Um, in that case, we will encourage you probably to um, start off your own design, uh, just because we actually print all the oligos at once, so we don't have like to stop pull. Um, so in that case, please uh, get in touch again. <laughs> we can whip out the design, you know, in a day, and then we can ship you the panel in three weeks. So it's faster. Okay, thank you. Um, Igor, a question around target. Um, how do you genotype tandem repeats that are longer than the PacBio reads? That's right. Great question. So, um, so the simple answer is we don't, uh, at least not yet. So we've been, uh, so far we've been limited uh, to, um, I would say, repeats that, that are, um, let's say, maybe 10, 12 uh, KB in length. And then we're also working on, on a workflow that would allow us to genotype uh, longer than the repeats. Uh, and we haven't decided whether we will release a uh, like a separate tool for analysis of repeats like this, or um, or maybe that would be a part of target as well. Because you know we uh, some tandem repeats, um, especially if we look at the telomeric or like centromeric regions, are extremely long, right? And I think yeah. there is you can make a strong argument that they should be like analyzed in, and interpreted in a different way uh, compared to um, repeats that target is, is designed for. But excellent question. Thank you. Uh, Igor, another question. Um, wh when will the genome-wide tandem repeat catalog that you're working on, on with Genome in a Bottle be available? It's actually available now. Um, so, um, so I can, um, so please reach out, I'll send you a link. It's in Zenodo. It was, I think, also like the Zenodo repository is. I have a link in, in on one of the presentation slides, so you can you can see it in the recording. Uh, that said, it's still uh, like an early draft. So if you'd like to start analyzing, by all means, please download it and start using it. Um, but also, you know, you might, you know, I'm sure there will be a much better, uh, much more precise version of this catalog, like in a month or so. Fantastic. Um, I think we have exhausted our list of questions. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, also, I would like to thank our two speakers, Igor and Tina. Thank you for uh, the presentations and for the for attending the Q and A. And then um, to the viewers of the webinar, we will send you a link uh, to the recording and post uh, when we when we wrap this up there will be a very very short survey um, if if some of you would stay on and, and answer the survey in a couple of minutes that would be fantastic um, and with that i i thank you again and and wish you a great day thank you thank, thank you, you.